Welcome to everyone for joining. Just let everyone come into uh, the room. Um, and uh, I, I just had a little bit of a shock when I uh, came to start this one up because um, uh, <laughs> uh, I, this is actually a brand spanking new uh, computer. And uh, uh, it was, uh, I uh, got it recently and it was um, something I did because I thought it would be uh, great. And I sort of took the view that I was only gonna load applications as I needed them rather than spend like half a day downloading and entering, entering sort of registration codes and all the rest of it. So anyway, so um, I sort of five, 10 minutes ago, I discovered I hadn't actually loaded Zoom on this thing yet. So I uh, um, uh, sort of had a bit of a panic to get that uh, right and uh, going. Um, uh, so, uh, as the new computer, it can tell you it's actually Core i9, uh, 12th gen, all the late CPU, GeForce uh, 3070 Ti, and all for, the, for all the lawyers out there, uh, I can tell you that uh, Flight Simulator has never been uh, this good. Um, the background, um, uh, I think the last Law Before Lunch I did was just before Christmas. And uh, I was had a, I was very sad and down in the mouth. I said I hadn't had a holiday for over two years, and um, uh, and you know and I didn't know whether I'd ever get away to Thailand or you know what the pandemic situation was going to be. And it's very sweet. A lot of you you know emailed afterwards in the New Year, or I was talking to you, and you said, "Oh, did you manage to get? Did you manage to get away?" And well, the answer is we did, and there we are. And that's Catherine and me uh, on the banks of the Chow Phraya in Bangkok on New Year's Eve at the uh, gala party at the hotel, uh, looking happy for the first time, I think, in two and a half years, two years. So we did manage to get away. Um, and oh uh, yeah, 3080, I thought, I thought, I thought about that, but I, I went for the i9, Amanda, uh, so I went for the i9, and, um, uh, <laughs> but you know, you can always swap out the 3080, so if I, if I want to get something later, you can upgrade that, but, but there we are. So um, anyway, um, with all that way of background, I think we've got loads of people in the room so um, what I'm going to do is start things now. So the recording's going and I'll pick up the recording from, from now. So welcome to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining at such short uh, notice. Uh, I am Richard Stevens. I am a commercial solicitor. I specialize especially in the world of uh, information technology and I help people put contracts together. I also provide training in the area of commercial law subjects to law firms and uh, in-house legal departments. I also work as a mediator and arbitrator in the world of IT as well. So uh, if you want any more information on that, please do get in touch. Um, I sent out this email to invite you to come uh, just two days ago. And what you want to find out about is loss of profits exclusions. And so that's what I'm gonna to turn to without further ado. And I'm going to share my screen with you uh, there. So uh, you will now have uh, the screen share will be on. And um, uh, these, this is the, the opening words of the judgment. The primary issue in this case concerns the proper construction of an exclusion clause. Whilst that may sound a little unexciting. Unexciting? Are you kidding, Lord Justice Coulsdon? Unexciting? I sort of undenied about whether I should send out uh, an invite to this in, um, uh, with such short notice. Do you know, within an hour of the emails going out, I had over 60 registrations, the number has just been going up and up. Unexciting? I think it's very exciting. Uh, I beg to differ with you, at least on that point in your judgment. Uh, this is really exciting stuff. Uh, the difference in this case was the difference between IBM paying, as the Court of Appeal pointed out, uh, either 80 million or 13 million. Uh, I know from uh, the people who are delegates today, um, some of these delegates are from the insurance industry, very relevant to them. Many have come from business, not just lawyers, not just in-house lawyers, but from business people. It's highly relevant to them to know what the risk profile of a contract is. No, this isn't unexciting, Lord Justice Coulson. This is really, really exciting. And it comes out of uh, this case, uh, and the judgment um, came out on the 4th of April. I got it um, before it got up on Bailey, because as luck would have it, I was seeing one of the counsel for IBM for a drink uh, last Tuesday, uh, and so as soon as the uh, Court of Appeal released their judgment to the public, I was able to uh, get hold of a copy and go through it uh, with my anxious little eyes. We don't need to spend too much time looking at the facts uh, of the case, which are very complex. Uh, the, the, the first instance judgment runs to, I think, 750 odd paragraphs. 
we don't need to worry about that. I'm going to call them Soteria. In the first instance, they were called Siskill. They were part of the, the co-op uh, uh, group of companies. Uh, and Soteria provides insurance services, underwriting, uh, in, insuring uh, individuals. We don't need to worry about that. They entered into a contract with IBM for a new IT system, which was hoped would provide them with a competitive edge in the marketplace. It was a major IT contract, about 50 million for implementation, a 10 year management services contract worth about 125 million uh, following on implementation, except it never got to implementation. Uh, there were serious delays and the parties seemed to be jockeying for position to get out, to get a sort of um, nice amicable break. Uh, and the Casas Belli, so to speak, was IBM's invoice for 2.9 million pounds odd in respect of some license fees. This was disputed by Soteria. It was not paid. Uh, IBM purported to terminate for non-payment uh, and Soteria uh, accepted that notice of termination as a repudiatory breach. Uh, and that was upheld by the judge uh, as justified. This is the uh, loss of profits exclusion provision. You can take a look through it if you like. Um, uh, it's uh, a bog standard loss of ex loss of profits exclusion, such as you would see that these things are ubiquitous. Uh, just about any uh, commercial contract in any sector, not just IT, will have a loss of profits exclusion. Um, we'll look at the reasons for that uh, in just a minute. But it is bog standard, and I'll, I've underlined the important bits. Neither party will be liable to the other for loss of profits, revenue savings, including anticipated savings. Absolutely standard. But if you ask, well, what law is there on this? It's a ubiquitous expression. You think there's going to be like a, a list of cases as long as you're on looking at what it means. But actually, that's not the case. And it was Mrs. Justice O'Farrell who first looked at this uh, herself in the Royal Devon case um, against Atos. IT services. Again, the words of exclusion are bog standard. Neither party will be liable for loss of profits or business or of revenue or of any goodwill anticipated savings. The difference in this case, of course, is that Royal Devon was an NHS trust and it was therefore a non-profit making body. And so she decided that in this case, a wasted costs claim made by Royal Devon was permissible notwithstanding the exclusion of loss of profits. Now, how she came to that uh, decision is extremely long and involved and took her through uh, much damages law back to Robinson and Harmon back in 1848. We don't need to go there. Very basically, what her judgment said was that uh, as a non-profit uh, body, uh, the benefit was anticipated to be non-pecuniary. Their expected benefit wasn't financial gain that would defray the costs they would incur to get the system. Uh, they would have had the system as a contractual benefit. So any claim, she said, for wasted expenditure was based upon a rebuttable presumption that exists in law, not that the system would produce revenues that would cover and exceed the expenditure, but rather that the use of the system would at least be worth the expenditure they were prepared to incur to get the system. That meant that Atos could have tried to show that Royal Devon's bargain was a bad one, that they wasted their money because they just paid too much for it, and therefore they would have wasted their money anyway. And if they could have shown that, then of course that would have uh, killed uh, Royal Devon's um, uh, claim for wasted expenditure. But there was no such evidence uh, to that effect. So the upshot of this decision was uh, loss of profits exclusion, Royal Devon could recover nonetheless its wasted expenditure. The position in Soteria, Siskill against IBM, loss of profits exclusion, almost identical wording, uh, she decided that uh, Soteria could not recover its uh, wasted expenditure, that the loss of profits exclusion was good to exclude uh, a claim for wasted expenditure. And the reason she got to that was she had to do uh, distinguish her own decision of some four years previously. And she said, in this case, um, uh, Siskill, Soteria being a profit earning body, the starting point was to identify the lost contractual benefit as a result of IBM's uh, repudiatory breach. The new system, she said, 
uh, would have improved their competitive advantage. It would create savings, increase revenues and profits. So their lost bargain, and that's what they were suing for, was their lost bargain consisted of the savings, revenues and profits that would have been achieved if the system had been successfully implemented. And it didn't matter how you framed your claim. You could frame it as a, a claim for loss of profits. You could frame it as a claim for wasted expenditure. They were simply two different sides of the same coin. You were basically claiming your lost bargain. To come to this conclusion, she went through a vast amount of case law right the way back to Robinson and Harmon in 1848, looking at the academic distinction between reliance and expectation losses, blah, blah, blah. blah. But the upshot of taking these two decisions together uh, was that if you're contracting with a profit-making entity, typically private sector, that meant uh, a loss of profits exclusion would exclude a claim for wasted expenditure. On the other hand, if you had a contract with a non-profit-making entity, typically public sector, a loss of profits uh, exclusion would not uh, defeat a claim for wasted expenditure. A, a number of us uh, felt rather uneasy uh, by this, just these two decisions. And it's just come out of the Court of Appeal. Uh, and to, long story short, um, uh, they decided uh, that, uh, uh, that the, the, claim, the exclusion of loss of profits uh, in this particular case uh, was not good uh, to exclude a claim for wasted expenditure. They looked through a vast amount of law themselves, not so much perhaps as Mrs. Justice O'Farrell. They looked at the standard cases on construction. We have this trilogy of cases uh, from the Supreme Court uh, on construction, illustrating that the courts have snapped back very much to a, a literalistic approach to construing contracts. But they said an aspect of construing, especially exclusion clauses is this, a party is not likely to be taken to have given up valuable rights in the absence of clear words. And the, the, the case on this, so often given, uh, are Lord Diplock's uh, word, uh, words in Gilbert Ash. One starts, he said, with the presumption that neither party intends to abandon any remedies for its breach arising by operation of law, and clear express words must be used in order to rebut the presumption. It's still very much alive as a concept. Uh, more recently, in the Kudos catering case, uh, Lord Justice Tomlinson said, had the parties intended such an exclusion of all liability for financial loss in the event of refusal or inability to perform, I would have expected them to spell that out clearly, probably in a freestanding clause rather than in a subclause uh, as it is here. So you look for very specific words if you're talking about uh, an exclusion. They also looked uh, at this, uh, the law of damages, uh, and they said, if you're coming uh, to make a claim for your loss of bargain, then you either uh, make a claim for loss of profits or a claim for wasted expenditure. They are true alternatives. You have one or you have the other. You can't have both. And just because you've suffered a breach doesn't mean to say that you automatically get substantial damages. And the classic case on that is the fairly recent case, I think the judgment of Justice uh, Tier in OMAC Maritime, uh, uh, if the charge was breach uh, coming out of that case, if the charge was breach in that case meant that the ship owner uh, had the opportunity to trade the vessel in at a better price simply because the market had risen in the meantime, mm -hmm. then by doing so, the ship owner had mitigated its loss and it couldn't claim any more. So, as I say, uh, the Court of Appeal unanimously decided that Mrs. Justice O'Farrell uh, was wrong in her ruling on loss of profits, and Soteria could recover for its wasted expenditure, notwithstanding this clause 23.3. And they gave five reasons for this, and I just set them out uh, on these uh, two slides. Um, first point, the short point, they said, is whether, as a matter of language, the description of the types of losses being excluded, namely loss of profit, revenue savings, is apt to cover or include wasted expenditure. In other words, they looked at this as a point of construction. It's not a question of starting with certain legal principles like expectation loss, reliance loss, compensatory principles. You just look at the words on the page and you say, well, what would a reasonable person, what would a reasonable person armed with all the knowledge reasonably available to the parties when entering into this contract, what would that reasonable person understand these words to mean? Would they understand them to mean just loss of profit as commonly understood? Or would they understand them to mean uh, wasted expenditure? 
as commonly understood. And the Court of Appeal had absolutely no doubt in saying that by loss of profits, but that did not cover that wasted expenditure. The second point they made was this, that as I say, it comes from this Gilbert Ash line of authorities, um, the more valuable the right, the clearer the words of exclusion must be. As the judges were saying, if you take IBM's argument to the extreme, um, the most obvious claim that Soteria would have will be to get its money back, wasted expenditure on an abortive IT system. But according to IBM's argument taken to the extreme, they couldn't even get that back. A loss of profits exclusion would stop them getting that money back. It's an obvious claim for uh, Soteria to make. And if it's an obvious claim, you would expect clear words uh, being needed to exclude such a claim. It would be possible to do it, maybe, but you would need very clear words uh, to exclude uh, such a claim. Uh, finally, there were three other reasons. There were, they said there were good reasons, good commercial reasons for distinguishing a loss of profits, et cetera, claim from a wasted expenditure type of claim. A loss of profits claim is inevitably going to include a lot of hypothesis. What would the profits have been if the system had been implemented, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is all hypothetical. Uh, and they said uh, a wasted expenditure claim is quite different in its nature, because for that, you've got invoice receipts, you've got proof of payment, you've got the concepts of the law that come in, you know, causation, remoteness, mitigation of loss. The law is very well equipped to deal with wasted expenditure claims. Uh, otherwise, if you have just hypothetical claims about loss of profits, failure to make anticipated savings, you have accountants arguing endlessly uh, about what those profits would have been good commercial reasons for saying you can't get hypothetical claims uh, and good commercial reasons for saying it still allows concrete claims for wasted expenditure. They also said that you know, the lost bargain for Soteria was the failure to get a new IT system. The, the lost bargain wasn't necessarily um, just the profits, uh, revenues and savings. Uh, and that meant, uh, because as, as they said, if you then said that uh, clause 23 was as broad as IBM was arguing for, then that would exclude all claims for its loss of bargain completely in potentiality. And that would be an extreme position. And again, one that would require very express wording. Finally, they said, um, it, it's just not right to, it's just not justifiable to characterize wasted expenditure as a means of, of calculating lost profits. And they said, and they pointed to this fact that you then had this strange dichotomy between contracting with a profitable body and contracting with a, a non-profit earning entity. And they said you could break it down even more. You might contract with a profit making business that might buy a back office system that wasn't designed necessarily to increase its uh, profits, but it might have a fuzzy, uh, meaning, uh, intention. They might want to mm, it, it, it have a happier workforce working with a more modern, more up-to-date sort of IT system. So they said, it, it, it's just, it just doesn't make sense to have the same formula uh, given two radically different meanings, depending on the identity of your counterparty. So what can we learn from this? Well, my first thought as I read through the judgment was a uh, few. Uh, sanity uh, is restored. I, I remember when I was a lad uh, starting out and I was an in-house lawyer at Logica, as it then was, and I was negotiating contract. I was uh, had just down on my chin. I was young. I was naive. The other party said, well, the most obvious loss we've got is the loss of profit, so therefore you can't exclude it. And I went back to my boss and, and said, well, um, that sounds reasonable. Why don't we just allow them loss of profits, but you know, cap it? And he said, no. And he said exactly what the Court of Appeal said. A loss of profits claim is a hypothetical claim. So if you get a good accountant uh, on the thing, they can take uh, a marginal profit and turn it into a thumping loss, or they could take a thumping loss and turn it into a runaway profit. All we want to do by excluding loss of profits uh, is to exclude hypothetical claims, which are just going to be worse for the parties and just limit them uh, to concrete items of loss like wasted expenditure. And then we seek to cap that. I think that's always been uh, the understanding of the commercial drafting community of what uh, a loss of profits exclusion amounted to. And I think the Court of Appeal has uh, very ably restated that case uh, and given us at Court of Appeal level uh, a, a solid foundation on which to go forward. But when we talk about going forward, um, obviously my, my friend at, uh, couldn't give away any confidences, uh, even over a bottle of wine, but um, they do have 28 days to decide whether they go to the Supreme Court. 
Half of me says it would be fantastic to have a Supreme Court deciding this uh, once and for all. The other half of me says it would be an absolute disaster if they reinstated uh, Mrs. Justice O'Farrell's uh, judgment. So it sort of left me uh, feeling quite queasy. I think this is going to be uh, an area, notwithstanding whether this is appealed or not, this is going to be an area that's going to be seeing a, a lot of uh, case law in the next uh, few years, which segues uh, into the, the, the last point. Uh, oh no, I say original thought now required. Well, we're commercial lawyers. A lot of us listening to this are commercial lawyers. What are we going to do? Uh, at the moment, you know, the Court of Appeal has upheld our standard view on this, but is there any way we can tighten up the wording? We commercial lawyers, we slavishly copy templates and precedents. Maybe she, we should move away from this loss of profits exclusion. Maybe we should be using different words. Maybe we should be defining this more clearly. Maybe we should be dealing with things. What about other formulae that you see in these exclusions? What's a failure to achieve anticipated savings? Is that different from a loss of profits? Is it something that's actually the same? If it's the same, why are we putting that formula in as well? Do we need to define what we mean by wasted expenditure? What would that definition look like? As I always say, I don't like making contracts longer, uh, but maybe we need to say um, you know, that the loss of profits exclusion doesn't exclude, exclude a claim for um, wasted expenditure and then give uh, a definition of wasted expenditure. As I say, it's too soon for me to come up with uh, a decided view as to what we need to do uh, going forward. Uh, I think as a drafting community of insurers, business people and lawyers together, I think it's uh, high time we put our heads together. I think it is dangerous uh, going forwards just to rely upon these hackneyed words of just loss of profit, loss of revenue, loss of savings, whatever. Uh, and I think probably it's time to, to step back from the fray, just breathe a sigh of relief at this judgment, uh, and then think about, is there some better way we can draft this wording? Because I think the principle is good. What we're trying to do with this is exclude hypothetical claims based upon calculating lost profit and focus the claim upon concrete items of wasted expenditure. I think everybody's agreed on that. Uh, if there are better ways of achieving that with better drafting, then I think we need to work towards that. That's uh, what I was going to say. If you, can, if you liked what you saw, then uh, obviously uh, that's great. Um, you can buy me a coffee. Richard Laws, is, if you head to buy me a coffee, is, is the reference you want. Other than that, I think some chat and some questions coming in. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for your attention so far. I will um, uh, turn off uh, screen share, Ooh, if I can do screen share. Okay. And uh, let's have a look at the, the questions. So Q&A, we got, is this a return towards contraproferentum, which had been on the decline recently? No, I don't think it is. It, it, it's, it's sort of there in the back door, as it were, because yes, contraproferentum has, it's not dead, but it's on life support. It's sort of moribund. But if you're trying to exclude a liability, then the courts, courts do look for um, express wording. And the more global, the more comprehensive your attempt to exclude a liability, the more express the wording that the courts would expect to see. And the Kudos case, um, if you want an example of that, is a really good example of, of where the courts will look at the wording. And that was a, an exclusion of loss of profits, et cetera. And I think that case actually also included a, 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 a wasted expenditure as well. And they excluded all these things. Uh, but, the, but the court said, well, in the case of a repudiated breach, that, that exclusion only worked as long as the other party was actually seeking to perform the contract. If it just simply turned its back on the contract and committed a repudiatory breach, then the exclusion didn't apply. So they got around it. So you can call it contraproferentum, you can call it an application of the Gilbert Ash principle. Uh, are claims for loss of profits and wasted expenditure always mutually exclusive? Well, I, I think they are because I think um, you, you you make your election, the courts have always said you, you make an election as to whether you go for your reliance loss or your expectation loss. They're not different types of loss, they're different ways of calculating the same lost bargain, um, but you, you choose one or the other, you can't, uh, you can't get both. Um, I think some questions on the chat as well. Uh, I'll ignore the, the 3080 uh, TI. I, I'm a bit gutted, actually. I didn't get a 3080 TI in retrospect. I, I think I should have gone, gone for that, but just one of those things, I suppose. Um, 
uh, does wasted expenditure refer to expenditure specifically with the other party? Uh, or would it could it include expenditure in relation to the project? Yes, it does. It, it, it wasted expenditure means not only what you spent on the other party, but it's subject to all the rules on mitigation, remoteness, causation. If you've got third party consultants, third party subcontractors, whatever it may be, that that goes into the pot as as, as wasted expenditure. So yes, absolutely. Following on from the above, is there a specific case law that defines wasted expenditure? No, uh, there is not. Um, and uh, I don't think there is. Um, as I say, one of the odd things uh, about this loss of profits exclusion is, is it's ubiquitous, um, but it doesn't actually have a huge amount of case law telling us what it is. Um, so uh, there's loads of stuff on reliance loss and wasted expenditure and uh, all this stuff, but there's, there's no actual neat sort of two line definition of it that I've ever seen in a case. I mean, you can look at cases on wasted expenditure. Um, uh, Anglia Television and Reed is, is one, for example, that comes straight to mind that was discussed uh, in, in the, in the, the Soteria case. Um, so, um, uh, so, so yes, there are, but there are illustrations of what wasted expenditure is going to be, but there's no neat two-liner that says, this is it, and you can just slot this into your contract now. So, sorry. Uh, Sarah, here, here, Richard, um, uh, uh, presumably uh, calling for uh, uh, some consensus on how we should go forward uh, with the wording. I, I quite agree with you, Sarah. Isn't the solution just to have the normal clause, which defines precisely what is recoverable as direct loss? Um, Yes, I, I, I agree, and um, I, I think that uh, would be a, a, a good way to go. But I, I think I think it's more sort of holistic than that. And I, I think you know we as a drafting community from all sides of industry need to come together and actually just absorb uh, this judgment and come up with a solution. If we can agree on the principle that we're trying to exclude hypothetical claims. Um, we should try to agree on wording that successfully um, achieves that. But um, that's my, those are my views on the, the subject. Any more questions or chat? Um, I could, of course, tell you about the pleasures of flight simulator on a Core i9 and 3070 Ti, but that's probably maybe of interest to you. I don't know, maybe some people out there who are fascinated uh, by this as a subject. Um, but um, there we are. What I've done is I've taken a recording of this. I'm going to um, uh, top and tail it and uh, pop it up on YouTube as well. So I'll, I'll send out an email in due course to you all so you can um, watch it on YouTube again or get your colleagues to watch it as well. Um, but uh, it's it's brand spanking new law. I haven't had a chance. I don't suppose anybody's had a real chance to go through it and come up with positive proposals for how we go forward. But uh, I think it's just, um, it's not unexciting. I'm sorry, Lord Justice calls and it's not unexciting. I, I'm absolutely gripped to have a, a, a decision on this. So thank you very much, Justin. Um, uh, uh, I think it's actually gripping to have a Court of Appeal decision on something that is at the very heart of what we as commercial people are, are drafting and trying to achieve. So, um, uh, any more, uh, any more for any more, any, any more questions, any more comments, anybody want to put some reactions on, on the chat, as whether you're pleased to see this decision or not, is it in line with, with what you think, what you always thought a loss of profits um, exclusion was all about? As I say, I was taught this 40 odd years ago, and uh, I was taught this was um, what loss of profits exclusions were all about, was to, to, to iron out, just to exclude not just loss of profits, but it wasn't suppliers being nasty or trying to be nasty and wipe out good and valid claims. Um, uh, it, was, it was an attempt to stop the parties arguing and arguing endlessly about what those profits would have been. So that's what it's all about. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I mean, I, I, I was um, baffled by um, Mrs. Justice O'Farrell's uh, 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 decision in these two cases and the upshot and the effect of both of them taken together. And I, I'm really glad to see the Court of Appeal having pronounced on this. Um, uh, so, yeah, it was, uh, doesn't sound new, say that the need to be clear around what is meant by wasted expenditure. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. And um, uh, how we do that is, is uh, an interesting question. 
commercial lawyers being commercial lawyers will probably just most people will just go back to the template and um uh and let's just sort of use the same old words. I think there's going to be a lot of case law on this um, coming out over the next few years. I think this is one that's going to, to run and run. Um, so uh, I think it behoves all of us in the drafting community, you know, insurers, um, business people, lawyers, I think it behoves us all to be a little bit more, a little bit more astute when we, when we look at these clauses. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. Yeah, okay. I'm going to keep this open for another another few seconds if there's any, any more questions popping on the, the Q&A. Um, but uh, uh, other than that, I'm going to be um, uh, going to be uh, shutting up. Well, yeah, a good one. Well, not only IBM standard clauses, Robert, I think everybody's um, standard clauses. And I'm, as I say, I haven't had enough time myself to absorb it and come up with some drafting. I think it's so important because as the Court of Appeal said in this case, the difference was um, the 13 million that Mrs. Justice O'Farrell found IBM liable for at trial and the 80 million that the Court of Appeal uh, made them pay uh, coming out of the appeal. This is desperately uh, in, in important stuff um, and it shouldn't be controversial. I agree, Jonathan, uh, it shouldn't be controversial. Um, I don't think we made a hash of it. Um, uh, I don't think we made a hash of it. I, I think it's just the usual thing with with lawyers. I think we just, you know, grab for the grab the template and sort of cut and paste the words in from in, from a template into our contract. We just don't think about what, what we're trying to do. And we've all got so used um, to uh, reading it uh, and using it, these wording that we just don't don't question any longer. Um, yeah, Alex. It, fortunately, it's um, the, the 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 bit on uh, the construction point. Alex is is quite short in the middle. It's only about sort of ten pages long. It's it's neat and it's sweet and it's beautiful reading. So it's very very clear. Um, so yeah, you can get it on Bailey. So uh, have a look for it. Thanks, Sarah. Um, much to be for thought. It will affect insurance coverage. Yeah, I think it probably will. I, I think it probably will. Um, hopefully, in a positive way. Um, but uh, okay, I'm going to be closing down in just a minute. I think people are just starting uh, to leave. As I say, it was extraordinary. I mean, I sent this out with great trepidation, one because it's a holiday week, and I thought, well, if I do it next week, even more people are going to be away. And I thought, um, uh, you know, no one's going to turn up. In the end, we had dozens and dozens of people. As I said. I've had so many emails from people saying they are on holiday and can't make it today, but am I going to be recording it and uh, can I have the recording? Um, so, uh, so I, I think it's uh, exciting, exciting news, um, fascinating reading. But uh, that's great. I, I see no more Q and A coming, so I am going to be shutting down in a few seconds. If you're if you're typing something out, uh, I'll just give you time to finish typing, see if it goes up in the Q and A, uh, and or comes up in the chat. But um, thanks to everyone for attending. Uh, I mean, the number of people who attended on two days' notice um, was uh, ex extraordinary. So uh, it just shows the interest uh, in this, this area. Um, so I, I think it's fantastic. Anyway, numbers dropping off quickly now. So I'm going to say thank you to everyone for attending. Great you could make it. Uh, really good if we could uh, talk sometime, any of you, about what impact it's going to make on your drafting, what we as an industry can do. It'd be fantastic to get something together uh, going forward. And um, so I'm going to sign out now. Uh, thanks to everyone. Um, have a great day. And uh, I'll pop this up on YouTube and let you know uh, where you can find it. So I'm going to shut down. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.